It's so good to be together again. And in my heart, I just feel like I want to pray for you. If you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling lost, struggling in these times, wondering about the future, we're talking about the kingdom way. And God has a way for you. And first of all and foremost, Jesus says, come to me. The beginning of the kingdom way is always first coming to the king, coming to Jesus. So let's do that right now. Jesus, I just want to bring to you, my friend, Lord, those who are listening, that person, Lord, who is just struggling and feeling lost and alone. Jesus, help them. You said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus, you're the king of kings, and you came to give rest to humanity, those who felt overburdened, Lord, grieved, under the burden of sorrow, broken, alone. Jesus, intercede right now for us and help us. And precious Jesus, give us the privilege of having your Holy Spirit just teach us right now that we might know better your kingdom way. Holy Spirit, we never want to take for granted the access we have to your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Here we are. We're in part four of the kingdom way. And I have been so enjoying this. I love talking about the kingdom way. Jesus said this was essential. Talking about the kingdom of God is essential to the, the ministry of the king of kings, to ministry of Jesus, the Lord and the Savior. He said, preach. He told the disciples. He told us. He said, bring the, the message, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world. That's the good news. The good news is the kingdom of God, the kingdom way. So let's dig in here. Here we go. We're talking about part four of the kingdom way. And we learned in part one and two that God transferred dominion and authority. We read that in Genesis 1:26, from heaven to earth, which is like saying from the unseen world to the seen world. He did it in a very particular way, though. I want you to see this. God moved that power directly from himself to mankind by saying, let us give mankind dominion and authority over all the earth. That's very important to know. And in doing this, God set up a parameter for himself, a condition for his own relationship to the earth. Think about that. God set that parameter up in, in setting up this condition of, for his own relationship to the earth by limiting it to or through mankind. Man. Is that not just amazingly um, generous, merciful of God? When God gives his word, you see, he cannot violate his word. God's character and holiness will never allow him to lie or violate his word. God did not say, he did not say, let us, speaking to himself, speaking to the Godhead, the Trinity. He didn't say, let us have dominion over the earth. No, no, no. God didn't say that. He said, let us give unto mankind dominion and authority over the earth. This is so important to understand because if you don't understand this, you see events and things happen around you and you tend to think, people say, well, if God's in control, how can a God of love do this? So follow this through with me. This is why God had to send his son Jesus in the flesh. Very important. All God and yet all man. God does not do anything on earth, remember this, without affiliation, association with flesh, with a human, a person on earth. And this helps us understand the necessity for God's entry into the human race by Jesus, the man. Remember, born of a virgin, the seed of God, but the body came through the woman the Blessed Virgin Mary made Christ God dwelling among us. See, this is the true meaning when we talk about Christmas and when we, we sing the song Emmanuel, this is what it really means. Emmanuel, it means God is with us in the flesh. Now, when God gave mankind dominion, God made Adam and Eve 
He made them royalty. He made them kings over the earth, right? They were called to rule, have supreme authority. You might say, well, Stephen, I don't remember ever reading anywhere in Genesis where God said Adam and Eve were kings or that they were royalty, but they had supreme rulership. They had supreme dominion and authority. Anytime you give somebody over a realm supreme dominion and authority, that's what we interpret as a king, royalty. And that's why Jesus is called the King of Kings. You got to always remember this. They were called to rule, have supreme authority over everything, not each other. Adam was never supposed to rule over Eve, nor Eve over Adam. This was all, the, all this other stuff came under the fall, right? Remember this Adam and Eve fell from what dominion? Not from heaven, they fell from dominion. So when, how can you be redeemed and understand the redemption plan of Jesus if you don't understand what you're redeemed back to? What have you been redeemed back to? And some people are think, they think, well, you know, it's, it's all about heaven. No, it's not. It's all about authority and dominion. Jesus came to get us back our title, get us back our rightful place. You know, there was a three-year-old boy and he was asked where he came from. He said, do you know where you came from, little Johnny? And he thought for a moment and he goes, Walmart. No, you didn't come from Walmart. You came from God's design. God created you. Read Psalm 139. It says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are God's works and that our souls should know right and well. Therefore, they fell from the king's dominion or the king's domain. They bowed a knee. Adam and Eve bowed a knee to the deceiver. And so they committed high treason. They gave their dominion away. Adam and Eve, our grandparents, they gave, when they committed treason to God, they gave away a gift God had given them, dominion and authority. They gave it away to the enemy who began now to work it against mankind. Look at Colossians 1 verse 13. It says that the Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself out of the control and what? And out of the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Oh my, what an awesome plan. And that's the redemption plan. You see, we're seeing it cover to cover in God's scripture, God's amazing plan for your life. There are consequences to giving away the farm. When you give away what God gives you, there's consequences. Adam gave away the farm. He gave away the dominion over the earth. And Satan set up a kingdom of darkness. He set up a counterfeit where he could pull the strings and launch wars and disease and famine and all kinds of garbage. The devil knew that Jesus was on earth to get humanity back God's gift of dominion. See, he doesn't want to lose control. Like the villain in a movie about an ancient dark kingdom with an emperor who enslaves mankind, the devil doesn't want to let go of that control over mankind. It's the same old good versus evil, except the difference is, is God has absolutely no control being all goodness, destroying all badness. But he's got a complication. You and me, he loves us. And we were born with this treason in our heart. So imagine, he's got to get our inner reality in alignment with the king of kings reality, right? He's got to get the kingdom in us so that he can pull us out of the kingdom of darkness. Now read this temptation that Jesus endures from the enemy out in the wilderness. We read it in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. Check this out. Again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And the devil said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Isn't it amazing what the deceiver wants, what the dark Lord wants in this, this world? He wants humanity's worship. Verse 10, then Jesus said to the devil, he said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. This is why your words, your prayers, your worship are so, they're so important. They're vital. The enemy cannot stand against your faith in God. He has no power against your faith in God. And this is how you release your faith. 
Jesus instructs us to pray in Matthew 6 because it gives God permission, listen to this, to interfere in the earth. Your prayers, when your prayers are in alignment with the king's way, they give God permission to interfere here on earth, to overpower darkness with light. Earth is still under the original lease. You read James 5, 16, listen to this. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer um, of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available, dynamic, in its working. Why are your prayers so important? Because your prayers give God license to work here on earth. This is why we pray in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus, the Word, John 1 says, was made flesh. He came and dwelt among us. God said in Ezekiel 22 that he was looking for a man to stand in the gap, to intercede for people so he could save them, but couldn't find anyone willing. God says a similar thing in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. God does nothing on earth without child of mankind being involved because he has given you and me, mankind, dominion and authority. And we know God doesn't give and take away. God doesn't give his word and then go, oh, I changed my mind. God does not, when God's gifts are without repentance, the Bible says. Psalm 115, verse 16, listen to this. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Did you read that? We know this, the earth and the heavens are the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All the gold, all the silver, all the oxygen, all the matter, it all belongs to God. But look at this. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth... God has given to the children of men for a time period. This lease of dominion and authority is for a set time period. You know, this is what Jesus talked about when the times are full, when the, when the seasons and the times of fullness have come. See, this is what we're going for here. And this is why in the meantime, you and I, we got to pray. We got to sing. We got to shout. We got to speak our faith out. We know that the heavens and the earth belong to God. But we can see here that God has truly given us a lease of time to exercise authority on earth. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. You know why? Because otherwise his kingdom is not showing up and his will is not being done. So many people think that everything happens is somehow God's will. It's not. Otherwise, many things that are happening that are bad, they're not God's will. All those things, they're not all God's will. Otherwise, why would Jesus have taught us to pray? You need to pray this way, he said in Matthew 6. Pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. We need God's kingdom to come, his kingdom way of doing things to come, and his will being done. Pastor asked his congregation one time to stand up. Over and over. And on finally, the fourth or fifth time, um, a little girl sitting with her family. She was five years old, little Jennifer. Um, the pastor said again, would everyone please stand up again? Little Jennifer goes, so that the whole congregation could hear, again? We got to stand up again? All I got to say is, little Jennifer, not even everything that happens in church is God's will. <laughs> I've heard people talk about tragedy, torment, abuse, floods, tornadoes, death and destruction, and somehow pin it all on Heavenly Father. You know, insurance companies call it an act of God. That's character assassination, my friend. When someone blames you for something bad that you didn't do, that's slander. That's character assassination. That's misrepresentation. Those are lies. Have you ever had people misrepresent you personally? Have you ever had that happen? I have. If you ever had people slander you, it's awful. It's not a good thing. It's evil. So to slander God, can you imagine how evil that is? Jesus said the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. You can read that in John 10.10. 10. The devil, he said, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But you know what? We end up blaming God. And we seem to take no responsibility for the ugliness and pain ourselves. It's like we're these sweet little saints. It's like we're completely innocent. What? Us? Mankind? Do something wrong? Oh, we didn't. It must be God's will. My friend, the curse causeless shall not come. That's what Proverbs says. So let me show you how God's kingdom way truly 
makes his benefits a reality. That's what we want. We want the benefits of God. You know what? I'm going to tell it. I think one of the best ways I can give it to you is through this story of this man, Pam and I. We got to hear this wonderful testimony one time. We were still living in Nashville, and this prominent businessman came to town, and he was at our church, and he gave his testimony, and it was an amazing, like this was just to hear this, an amazing true life story from this guy who had it all. He was an atheist, and he was very successful in business, business and had all this wealth and everything, and one day, he was, you know, maybe in his late 30s, he got a, um, a report from the doctor that he was terminal. He had bone cancer. And the doctor said they couldn't do anything for him. So for the next year or so, he traveled the world spending unbelievable amounts of money trying to get healed, trying to get better, trying to solve this problem because he considered himself a self-made man. He was used to overcoming challenges and he thought, you know, I've done all this, I've done this, I can take care of this too. And so he thought he could, with his own power, somehow um, overcome this sickness traveled all over the world, spent everything he had. Long story short, he said, I ended up in New York City, he said, in a very, very cheap hotel. He said, I had maybe 200 bucks left in my name. He said, I didn't know what to do. He said, the final hope, the final doctor, the final so-called healer I went to, he said, just told me, you just need to get things right. And he said, he said something like, you need to get things right with God because there's nothing we can do for you. He said, I didn't believe in God. He said, I went back to my little cheap hotel room and he said, I sat on the bed completely hopeless, completely hopeless, everything gone, alone. He said, all my friends, he said, I didn't have any left, nobody with me. And he said, I sat there and he said, I finally, I thought, I wonder if God's real. And he said, I said, God, if you can help me, I'll give all of my life to you. There's not much left. But if you will help me, if you'll save me, I'll give it all to you. He had an instinct to look in the drawer beside the bed. Of course, there was a Gideon's Bible. He opened it up. And he just kind of did that random thing where like, oh God, talk to me. Opened the Bible and the Bible fell open to Proverbs 3. And he put his finger down. And he began to read right where his finger landed in Proverbs 3. And this is what the gentleman read. He said, said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. See, his whole life had been about leaning on his own understanding. Then it said, in all your ways, acknowledge God and God will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. Then he read this, verse 8. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. He was in awe. He was like, that's what I need. I need strength and healing in my bones. So he closed the Bible on his thumb and he said, God, I'm, I'm, I repent of trusting in myself with all my heart and now I put all of my heart and all of my trust in you. I want everything that you have for me. God, I'm yours. It was just a simple prayer. Opened up the Bible again and he read one more verse. And it said, honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. And he was like, all my, he said, all I got is left is just maybe 200 bucks. And right away an instinct hit him. He said, I'm going to give it all to the first Christian ministry I can find. So he went out walking and I think he ran into like a, a Salvation Army or something, walked in and just made this anonymous donation of his $200 and change. Well, that gentleman was standing before us now in Nashville a few years later, just a few years later, and he was already, he said, I have all my wealth back and then some. He said, I have all my health back. He said, I have a perfect health track record from the doctor. He's like, you're healthy. There's nothing wrong with you. No cancer, nothing. All these blessings God had came upon him. And he wasn't saying that somehow he bought his way into the kingdom, but he let go. What it was was he let go of all of himself. He let go of being enthroned on his own heart as, as God of his life and realized, 
I need a savior. I need Jesus on the throne of my heart. Gave it all away, all of his opinions, all of his atheism, all of his, um, his mind construct came and fell at the, the feet of Jesus. And he let Jesus be the Lord of his life. And now he said, I approach the word of God. He said, the Bible as the flawless word of God. And he says, when God says jump, he says, I say, how high? It was an awesome testimony. It was so encouraging. But I share that with you so that you might know that there are benefits on the kingdom way. You can't just receive Jesus as the king, but not receive the kingdom way of doing things. Are we really so ignorant to think that Christianity is about attending church to somehow ease our guilt for the week? Sing to the back of someone's head for a few minutes and think that that pleases God? Come on. God didn't send Jesus to give us church. He sent Jesus to give us his kingdom, the kingdom way. When there is no other way, the kingdom way. Why? To get kingdom results. God gets no glory from you being stuck in the rituals and the traditions that go nowhere. He gets glory when you walk in your true identity, in the royal family name of Jesus, in the name of the King of Kings. How can you fulfill your purpose if you don't know who you really are? If you don't know the family name, do you really think a J-O-B or a career will somehow satisfy that inner longing for rightness, for peace and joy? Only being who God designed you to be will hold these mysteries and these blessings. The inheritance God gives us, it's for the sons and daughters. The inheritance of God is for his sons and daughters. No one else, not his servants. It's for the sons and daughters. Can sons and daughters serve? Absolutely. But your identity is as a child of God. Sons and daughters of God are royalty. Royal servants? Absolutely. But still royalty in the kingdom of God. Let's look at 1 Peter 2 verse 9. It says here, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchase, special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, man, that's good. You see, you cannot set forth the wonderful deeds of God and display the virtues of God without being who God made you to be, a royal priesthood. This is highly unusual because uh, a royal priesthood, what, you know, what in the world is that? Because, you know, truthfully, priests aren't supposed to be royal and royalty isn't supposed to be a priest. So royal because you're in God's family. How could you be in God's family and be anything less, right? How could you be in God's family and be anything less than royalty? People who hold on to their sinner identity in Christ do not have an understanding or a revelation to the full extent of his saving, redeeming power. You're underestimating God's redemptive plan. You're diminishing it. You're trying to think of God's redemptive plan through sinner's eyes. You need to see it through the eyes of Jesus. That's why the word says in Ephesians, we are seated where in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, not in low places. You don't have friends in low places, but in high places, right? It says here in 2 Chronicles, um, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. So tell me, is the old passed away or not? Are we going to believe your word or God's word? Ah, Stephen, you're putting, you're putting some tough ones across the plate for me. See, it takes royalty to exercise authority and dominion. You know, you've been wondering why maybe your prayer life has been struggling. Well, it takes authority. It takes royalty to exercise authority and dominion. If you don't step into your true identity, then authority and dominion doesn't work properly for you. This is why an old sinner mindset, no matter how humble that may seem, it's not really truly submitted to God. It can't work God's authority. God didn't come. He didn't send Jesus to save sinners to stay sinners. He sent Jesus to save sinners to become children of the Most High God. You can't have it both ways. You know, if, if the old is passed away, it's passed away. 
You can't keep bringing it up and talking about it and living out of it. Now, a priest, because you intercede for others. That's why we're called a royal priesthood, because we're called to pray for and intercede for others. That's what priests do. They stand in the gap for others. The role of priest brings petitions and requests to God, interceding for others, praying for other people. We get that privilege. This is why Jesus never told us to go and preach a gospel. No, no. We're instructed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's the only way to produce a royal priesthood. When Jesus said, repent, it fully sounded like this. Repent, Matthew 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. That's what he said. The king was calling to his citizens to change their thinking. Let go of the sinner way of thinking. The sinner, I had, the sinner identity... <laughs> and come into being a royal child of God. He was restoring order. Instead of a consumer mindset, subject to the futility of the outside in, no dominion, no peace, Jesus was giving us an inner reality of self-identity, being joy and peace, mastering the outer reality. See, this does not come natural, but it's a supernatural thing. It's learned by knowing the Word of God. It's Holy Spirit taught. You can have the kingdom resources if you're living inside the kingdom. You cannot have the kingdom resources living outside the kingdom. See, this answers, this is the answer to all your dreams on the inside. Let me share one more story with you. This is so good. Myra Wattinger was a single 40-year-old nurse. One day she was doing home care, visiting uh, an ailing senior man when his middle-aged son showed up drunk and he raped her. Myra found out she was pregnant. It was 1943 and she was utterly hopeless. She thought about killing herself. She wanted to get an abortion. She prayed to God. But suddenly God spoke to her in her hopelessness. She felt like God said the baby would bring joy into the world. And suddenly God turned the curse into a blessing for her. I don't believe, with, I don't believe for a moment that it was God's will for that to happen to Myra. But you know what? I've learned through Deuteronomy 23, 5, that God is able to turn the curse into a blessing. He's done it in my life. It wasn't God's will for me to be without a dad, but God turned the curse into a blessing for me. Fast forward to just a few years ago, and Pam and I got to be on one of the most famous Christian TV shows in America. We were in Dallas, Texas. And before we, leave this, before we left the studio, the host of the show came up and gave me his book. It was called My Father's Face. And yes, the author was James Robeson. James Robeson was that unwanted baby of Myra's. He was that unwanted baby. Even on his birth certificate, his mom had written and answered this question. Uh, apparently back then there was a question, is the baby legitimate? And she wrote a big no. But God rewrote James' birth certificate with a big yes. This is my son in Christ Jesus. God said he's legitimate. He gave, God gave James the family name. Can you see it? James Robeson was drawn out of the kingdom of darkness, out of illegitimacy, out of the death curse of the enemy, and into the kingdom of God's dear son. He not only got saved from darkness, but got saved for light. From being a baby destined for abortion, God ransomed little James' life and made him um, uh, globally set him forth into the wonderful deeds, the wonderful works and the virtues and the perfections of God for all of mankind to see. God made a baby destined for abortion to be part of the royal priesthood, the family of God. My friend, you can have that too. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter who has rejected you. It doesn't matter who has hated you, who has forsaken you, or who has scarred you. Jesus paid the full price for you to be in God's royal family. He has recommissioned us with dominion and authority as envoys of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. My friend, you can have all of that right now. 
You just need to say this simple prayer with me. You just need to make Jesus the Lord of your life and welcome the King of Kings upon the throne of your heart. Pray this, dear Lord Jesus, I need all of you for all of me. You are the way. Your kingdom come in my life. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. Take the throne of my heart. Be the Lord of all my decisions and give me every kingdom benefit. In your name, Jesus, amen.